Would you live on 133 bucks a month for food? I should try it because you know how fabulous I'd look. I'd be so skinny. I mean, Cameron adds, adds 10 pounds. It really does. I'm I would be looking great. We really messed up. And we're all very sorry. I personally apologize to you that that happened. I am the worst journalist in the world. The White House Soup of the Day. My favorite radio guy in Fort Lauderdale is Minestrone Chicken Sausage. I want you to watch what we're about to do because you've never seen anything like this on television. Yo, yo, yo. Welcome to Breaking the Set. So it looks like yet another governmental agency is overstepping its boundaries. This time it's the DEA. Get this. The Drug Enforcement Administration is now trying to access the private prescription records of patients in Oregon without a warrant, despite a state law forbidding it. But of course, since when's the government subject to its own laws anyway? Well, the ACLU and its Oregon affiliate are challenging this practice in court, arguing that this is an assault on the Fourth Amendment. But wait, I seem to remember a provision in the Patriot Act that already allowed the governmental seizure of medical records without a warrant. You know what? I give up. There are just too many violations to keep count of anymore, so let's go break the set. I want you to watch what we're about to do, because you've never seen anything like this on television. Today is an exceptional day because I'll be talking to someone who throughout his entire career has stood as a symbol of bravery, integrity, and justice. I'm referring to George Galloway, a man who many of us were introduced to in 2005 when he testified to the U.S. Senate over alleged illicit payments from the U.N.'s Oil for Food program. In case you don't remember his rebuttal, let me jog your memory. Now, I know that standards have slipped over the last few years in Washington, but for a lawyer, you're remarkably cavalier with any idea of justice. I'm here today, but last week, you already found me guilty. You traduced my name around the world without ever having asked me a single question, without ever having contacted me, without ever having written to me or telephoned me, without any contact with me whatsoever. And you call that justice. Well done. Needless to say, he put our representatives to shame. I'd say justifiably. When you look at the needless wars that those same congressmen signed off on. So to talk about the war on terror, the prospect for peace in the Middle East, and the two-party dictatorship right here in the U.S., I spoke earlier with George Galloway himself, respect member of parliament and author of Mr. Galloway Goes to Washington, the Brit who set Congress straight about Iraq. I first asked him about the allegations against him for taking oil from Iraq and why he thought he was being targeted politically. Check it out. Well, I wasn't alone in it. The political secretary to Nelson Mandela, the political secretary to uh, the then His Holiness the Pope, and me and the former foreign minister of France. Uh, not exactly a rogues gallery, more a gallery of people who had been a thorn in the side of U.S. policy towards Iraq during the sanctions period when every six minutes of every night and day an Iraqi child was dying as a result of sanctions that were imposed for possession of weapons of mass destruction, which it turned out, of course, infamously, Iraq didn't even possess. So it was a kind of badge of honor. <laughs> uh, but it was one of my best days, I must tell you. Put it, put it this way, the senator in charge is no longer a senator. I'm still a member of parliament, and they never asked me back. <laughs> well, that's what made it so absurd, is the fact that, you know, here the U.S. is having these close, these close ties with Iraq when the regime was at its worst, and then, of course, trying to make a scandal out of you having, you know, ties with the regime. It's just, it's totally absurd. But I wanted to move on to Afghanistan. I mean... The U.S. is claiming that the war is over. We know that there's a strategic pack with Karzai to keep troops there well past 2014. I mean, but as the troops have began withdrawing last year, we saw a record number of drone strikes, George, 333 within the first 10 months alone of 2012. What do you think about this shift in policy now to drone wars? Well, drone wars are uh, cheaper in human terms because, of course, although the U.S. has declared the war effectively over, 
young American and British soldiers are still coming home in boxes, others without their limbs, uh, others uh, uh, have gone crazy in the war zone and murder them, their wives or kill themselves or fill the police and prison cells of the respective nations or litter the pavements uh, with the other homeless people uh, who have been abandoned by the very society they were told they were fighting to protect. Drones, of course, murder uh, just as many people, uh, but they don't run the risk of, uh, of allied casualties. Um, President Obama saw fit to make a joke out of all of that. He said that you don't, uh, you don't see these drones coming. That's true, you don't, until your wife is uh, sitting there beside you minus her head, until your children are in pieces, literally, in front of your eyes, until you and your household are blown up. You don't know that these drones are coming. Uh, President Obama thought that was a laughing matter. I can assure you it isn't for the populations amongst whom the drones' uh, rockets are falling, and it isn't amongst the hundreds of millions of their co-religionists around the world who grow ever more crazy with anger at the double standards and the injustice of Western policy towards Muslim areas of the world. Absolutely. You just articulated it perfectly. I mean, the fact that this is being joked about, the fact that it's even being used as our new counterterrorism strategy is outrageous. I mean, they're counterproductive. They create more terrorists. I mean, that's what it's doing. It's radicalizing people who are affected, which, of course, countless civilians have died. It all comes back to the war on terror, George, though, where unlike any other war, at least in, the, in history that I've learned, I mean, we're fighting a tactic that will always exist. There's no end in sight. I mean, what is the danger of this new mindset of fighting terror? Well, I said uh, behind me in the Houses of Parliament just a few days after 9-11, when the House was recalled for the emergency, I said that uh, I despise Osama bin Laden, the medieval obscurantist savage. The difference, I said, between me and you, the rest of you, is that I always despised him. I despised him when you were giving him guns and money on the immoral principle that my enemy's enemy is my friend, the enemy at that time, of course, being the Soviet Union, and the British and the Americans brought al-Qaeda into Afghanistan in the first place. But in the same speech, I said, if we handle this the wrong way, we will create tens of thousands of new bin Ladens. And, of course, I underestimated. We have created hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of new bin Ladens. Everything that we have done since 9-11 has almost been designed to multiply, proliferate terrorism, extremism, fanaticism around the world. And we're at it again, of course, already in Mali, where a dictatorship is under pressure from a group of uh, opponents, some of whom are Islamists, some of whom are not. And these uh, opponents uh, are dubbed al-Qaeda, and we're bombing them. And as I said to the prime minister just today, in Parliament at Prime Minister's question time. Please tell me the difference between the Al-Qaeda we're killing in Mali and the Al-Qaeda we're supporting in Syria in order for them to kill uh, thousands of innocent people, Christians, Shiites, and other religious and ethnic uh, minorities. So the whole strategy was doomed and flawed from the start. And everything that we in the anti-war movement predicted has come true and in bucket loads. And yet, um, these people don't seem to learn from their mistakes. It was said famously of the Bourbons, whose inattention led to the French Revolution in 1789, that they learned nothing and they forgot nothing. And that's true of the latter-day Bourbons, who run your country and mine. They don't learn from their mistakes. They constantly compound them. And the big swamp of hatred and bitterness out of which Islamist extremism climbs is being endlessly deepened, watered with new blood and new injustices. It does seem, George, that it is, it's so outrageous, it's so obvious that it really does seem sometimes like it is by design to just keep 
terrorism, uh, ex you know, exacerbated and, and just keep these wars in per per perpetuity. It really does make me question. Uh, you just said something, though, about the hatred, the anti-American sentiment, kind of the anti-West sentiment that's growing undoubtedly in the Middle East. And many, many also say that it stems from the Palestine-Israeli conflict. You've been very vocal about this. You, you said at one point that you want to dedicate your life to the cause of Palestine. I mean, how much do you think this tight allegiance that the U.S. has with Israel damages peace and stability in the Middle East? Well, it damages America's interests, uh, let me say, uh, immediately. And that's increasingly recognized by the man who is in line to become the next uh, defense secretary, uh, by the former, at least, chief of the armed forces of the United States, who described in front of the Armed Services Committee in Congress uh, the relationship with Israel as a strategic liability for the United States. And he was certainly telling the truth in that. Nothing could be more damaging to the United States than its absolutely unhealthy, obsessively uh, uh, close relationship to a regime in Tel Aviv, uh, which is regarded by most people in the world as a terrorist, rogue state, yet it's endlessly rewarded for every crime that it commits, and every crime that it commits is paid for by the U.S. taxpayer. Uh, but undoubtedly, the uh, Palestine question is the heart of the matter. It's the flaw at the heart of Western policy towards the East. And until there is justice for the Palestinian people, there will never be peace in that region. And if there's no peace in that region, there'll be no peace in the world. Yet Netanyahu, uh, the serial killer, and the man who's literally paving the uh, illegally occupied West Bank of the Jordan with illegal Israeli settlements, uh, will be received in Washington and London with the same red carpet, uh, no matter what crimes he commits. And uh, we know from the overheard conversation between President Obama and the then French President Sarkozy that neither could bear to look at the other, look at, uh, at Netanyahu's face. They agreed with each other. They didn't know the microphones were switched on. Mm. They said that they could not bear to look at this man. And yet, when it comes to writing the checks, sending the weapons, and rolling out the diplomatic and political support, they can always be counted on to do that. Stay tuned for the rest of my interview with George Galloway right after the break. If you like what you see so far, go to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash breaking the set. Subscribe to us. Check us out on Hulu as well, hulu.com slash breaking the set. Like us on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash breaking the set. And follow me on the Twitterverse at Abby Martin. That did break for now, but stay tuned to hear about George Galloway's experience in Parliament next. I got news for you, gang. The world is round. Let me, let me ask well, you a question. No, no, let me ask you a question. Here, on this network, is where we're having the debate. We have our knives out. The, the issue press. is the surveillance How do you justify state. staying there we are, as a guest? We are in a situation where the entire... I didn't agree to talk about the surveillance state. state. Here's the rest of my interview with George Galloway, respect member of the UK Parliament. George, let's move on to your government. Um, you were a member of the Labour Party 36 years, then you joined the Respect Party in 2004. 
What made you switch, and why do you think that America's stuck in this two-party dictatorship, is what I like to call it. It's so taboo to even talk about socialist ideals, uh, which is, I know, uh, respect represents. Well, I was expelled by Tony Blair from the Labour Party in 2003 uh, for my role as one of the leading figures in the anti-war movement against the war on Iraq. Uh, and I founded the Respect Party, mm. which came out of the great anti-war movement, which organized the biggest demonstrations that Brit Britain has ever seen in its history, indeed five times bigger than the next biggest. Uh, at its height, and we're almost at the anniversary of that demonstration, February 15th, when we had two millions on the streets of Britain, representing tens of millions of people, I think, uh, in opposition to the war on Iraq, even before people knew what we now know, that the entire thing was built upon a tower of lies. Uh, but the uh, expulsion uh, was another badge of honor, because it was increasingly... Uh, difficult and becoming impossible to remain in a party led by Mr. Blair, who is a war criminal and who should be on trial in The Hague instead of swanning around the world making millions of dollars as a consultant to all sorts of grisly sovereign wealth funds of various dictatorships and uh, exorbitant lecture fees, most uh, often in the United States, plus the fees from being uh, a director and a consultant for many multinational corporations. So it's been good for business so far as Mr. Blair is concerned. He is a religious man. I suspect that on the judgment day, he'll find that uh, it's, the questioning's a little tougher than the British Parliament uh, was ever able to hold him to. Uh, the Respect Party believes uh, that uh, asking poor people to pay for the crimes of rich people, uh, the crimes and the mistakes and blunders that led us off the cliff into recession and worse uh, is unfair, unjust, and we will not accept it. And reclassifying wars as missions and continuing to cause the deaths of countless people in the former empire now being recolonized again, as well as the deaths and destruction of the lives of our own service personnel, especially at a time when we have no money to keep our old people uh, warm in the winter time, uh, but we can always find money to go around the world setting fire to other people's countries. Uh, that this way of organizing things is simply not acceptable. It cannot be as good as it gets. There must be a better way. We try to highlight it. And respect is the fastest growing party in British politics. And I wish there was a respect phenomenon in the United States. I have a weekly radio show in the United States on a New York uh, radio station called WBAI. It's called the mother of all talk shows. And it's a constant uh, recurrent uh, theme. I was having to uh, defend uh, Obama, at least to the extent of saying, you should elect him rather than the other guy, that Romney uh, will be even worse than President Obama. But people ask the legitimate question, how come that's the only choice. Right. Uh, two cheeks of the same backside, Tweedledee and Tweedledum. <laughs> Why isn't there a real choice in American politics? Unfor and I think unfortunately, that's something George, that Americans I were, are going to have to confront as an issue sooner rather than later. Absolutely. Uh, George, unfortunately, we're out of time. And you know what? We live in a two-tiered justice system, but you are such an inspiration for working within the system and really being a voice of reason. And you're, I just applaud you for that. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Thank you. I'm a big fan of yours. So are all my staff. Awesome. Great to be on your show, Abby. Thanks, George. Keep speaking truth to power. With all this talk about President Obama's next big policy focus, turning to immigration, I've been curious about what he could possibly have to say about reform when the policy adopted for his first term resulted in a record 1.5 million deportations. So, will immigration reform proposed by the White House be as empty of a promise as was the closure of Guantanamo Bay? Or will the millions of undocumented immigrants finally see progressive legislation to help their legal status? to talk about real immigration reform and the militarization of the border. I'm joined now by RT correspondent Ramon Galindo from our LA studio. Good to have you on. Hey, Abby. 
Hi. So, Ramon, I know that immigration reform legislation hasn't been drafted yet, but can we expect the, the government to come up with a plan that will actually be fair to the millions of undocumented immigrants in the U.S., especially the ones who are underage? No, you're absolutely right. Now, we don't have all the details yet, but we get a good idea from the framework. Now, conservatives will say that this is not fair, that this is just amnesty, but immigrant rights advocates will point out that it's it's the furthest thing from amnesty. There are a lot of punitive elements to the reform efforts, both from Obama and from the Senate proposal. There's no wording or, or any mention of stopping any of the deportations. And in both plans, both the Obama camp and in the Senate bipartisan uh, crew that came up with their own plan, uh, I mean, they talk about their first objective being tougher border enforcement, so obviously signs that the militarization along the border uh, would likely only increase uh, during, uh, you know, with any sort of reform effort. And let's talk about the militarization of the border. I know that there's drones. This is obviously affecting the prison industry. How? Sure. Well, I mean, the pri private prison industry is already benefiting quite a bit. Now, we're talking about the GEO Group and uh, the Corrections uh, Corporation of America, which already has some very lucrative uh, contracts with uh, with the federal government to uh, house uh, people who are arrested for immigration offenses. And we've seen from recent reports that, I mean, fed federal immigration uh, offenses make up now 30 percent of the federal MA population. So, and, and given the fact that there doesn't seem to be any sort of reduction in the amount of people who are being arrested, we can uh, only assume that these private uh, prison facilities are going to be used more and more as uh, board enforcement gets tougher and tougher. And Ramon, yes, definitely the private prison industry is definitely going to be profiting off this. Um, and a lot of people say that, you know, Obama hasn't effectively secured the border, but, but drones are so precise in surveillance. I mean, they're the best surveillance tool that we have, and we know that they're being used. Um, so is this going to keep increasing the militarization of our borders, Ramon? Well, right now, the Customs and Border Protection is in possession of 10 drones. Uh, over the past uh, seven years, uh, this drone program to patrol the borders on the southwest border, Florida area, and on the Canadian border has cost the federal government more than a quarter billion dollars. And so far, uh, watchdog groups inside of Homeland Security have said that this is an inefficient program. Yet, despite uh, the fact that the drones aren't even working, uh, Customs and Border Protection or already inked a deal with defense, contr defense contractor General Atomics for uh, up to 14 more drones. So uh, what we see is, um, you know, with any sort of reform effort that we're going to see, we're definitely going to see a lot more spending uh, on defense. We're drones USA, Ramon, not surprising at all. I mean, but how hypocritical is this really in, in light of the fact that, you know, here Obama's making these overtures toward immigration reform, but really he's deported a record number of immigrants here. Yeah, as you mentioned, uh, more than a million and a half uh, during his tenure, more than George Bush or any other Republican, 400,000 just in the last year. And in this latest uh, reform push that he spoke about earlier this week, I mean, he didn't really make a lot of mention of these families that are being split up. He didn't make any mention of the hundreds and thousands of immigrants who have died trying to cross the border. So uh, when immigrant rights activists see this push, they're uh, very rightfully so uh, cautious about uh, what uh, these latest reform efforts will bring about. Uh, absolutely. A lot of questions to bring up, especially about human rights uh, with the drones and the deportations. Thank you so much, Ramon Galindo, for shedding a light. You bet. Today marks the 40th anniversary of what is still referred to as the biggest scandal in Washington's history, Watergate. On this very day, two members of President Nixon's committee for re-election, Gordon Liddy and James McCord Jr., were found guilty and convicted of conspiracy, burglary, and attempting to wiretap the Democratic Party's headquarters at the Watergate building right here in D.C. The roots of the Watergate scandal can be traced back to Nixon's presidency, which was notoriously secretive. A famous example being the release of the Pentagon Papers, which exposed the secrets of Vietnam and information about illegal bombings of Laos and Cambodia without congressional knowledge. The Pentagon Papers hitting the press smeared Nixon's image, and as a result, he came even more evasive and distrusting of the American public. 
Ironically enough, as reserved as he was, Nixon made audio recordings of meetings and personal thoughts he had in the Oval Office, material that would soon lead to his demise. He had a group of people working for him under the committee to re-elect the president, also known as Creep. These are the guys that got caught breaking into the Democratic National Headquarters, but their connection to President Nixon had yet to be made. It wasn't until after Nixon won re-election that his association with the burglars was discovered, which marked the beginning of a formal investigation against him. It's important to note that Nixon and his chief of staff conspired to have the CIA bring the investigation to a halt by saying it was a national security matter. Sound familiar? Needless to say, that plan failed, which led to these famous words. In all of my years of public life, I have never profited, never profited from public service. I've earned every cent. And in all of my years of public life, I have never obstructed justice. And I think, too, that I can say that in my years of public life, that I welcome this kind of examination because people have got to know whether or not their president is a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. I've earned everything I've got. Those words proved to be empty. Even though Nixon claimed executive privilege in the case, in 1974, the Supreme Court forced him to release the tapes. And this is a very important decision because it sent a message to the president and to the public that said, no one is above the law. But before he was subject to the embarrassment of congressional hearings and inevitably impeached, Nixon resigned. In addition to ridding this country of one of its most corrupt presidents ever, multiple pieces of legislation were passed in the wake of his presidency that pushed for more transparency in government. Watergate helped give rise to a new kind of journalist, the investigative reporter, people like Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein. It's reminded us of the importance of leakers and whistleblowers like Daniel Ellsberg and Mark Felt of Deep Throat, people that were vital in bringing dark truths to light. And perhaps the most important lesson of all is that the President of the United States is not above the law. And my, oh my, how much that's changed today. Aside from the serious lack of investigative journalism done by the same media industry that exposed Watergate, if you look at the Bush and Obama presidencies, you'll see that there's zero accountability for their lawlessness. It's amazing to think that Nixon was brought down because of one instance of wiretapping. Look at the state of our government today. Warrantless wiretapping is rampant. And now, instead of whistleblowers being applauded, they're being imprisoned. What happened? How did we stray so far? And most importantly, how do we go back?